Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday Night Live over here on the JK Ultra YouTube. So excited to see everybody. Oh, hey, Marcella. Hey, Natasha. Thank you for telling everyone to like the live. I'm going to be also going live over here on TikTok over on this side. So, so great to see everybody. So today we have some very exciting things to talk about. So I just, with minutes to spare, um, just posted a video, which I'm calling an update to that Reddit post. So I'm sure you guys remember, but I'm just going to refresh for anyone who's watching this later, that last week there was a viral Reddit post that was taking over the internet. I heard people say that Joe Rogan tweeted it. Um, I wouldn't know. I'm banned from Twitter. So um, if you say so. But I think that also contributed to it going so super viral. And this guy talked about, well, guy, I'm assuming guy. I don't know what the person was. And for the sake of this, I might use guy. I might use they. We'll, we'll see um, whatever comes out. So um, basically with this guy um, or person, he says that he was a molecular biologist and that he worked on this program that he dissected alien specimens and alien bodies. So I was obviously really intrigued by that. And based on what he said, he said that these species looked like what you would call a gray in folklore. So... He said, you know, and as we know, folklore doesn't mean that it's a fairy tale. Folklore means that it's the stories of the folk. The folk are the people. The people are us. So basically the stories of the people about greys. He says that the beings that he worked on in these secret programs appeared to be similar to that. Now, because we all know Tim, who worked in the German covert governance he basically worked with great aliens. I wanted to ask him to, are, are these greys? So we're very lucky that we have access to be able to ask those questions. So the first thing, you know, I sent it to Tim. First, I sent him my video and I was like, can you give me your opinion if these are greys? And then he kind of took so long to respond to it that I ended up... Each time I asked him, I wanted more out of it then. So like first I was like, can you just like tell me what you think if these are grays? And the longer it took him to answer the question, I'm like, okay, well now can you make an entire video of yourself explaining why? And thankfully he did. So um, the main things that I asked him is, do you believe that the beings that are in this Reddit molecular biologist posts are actually grays? And why would you think that or why not? And what are some of the things that stick out that are consistent with grays and some of the things that are inconsistent with grays? And also I asked him about the religious beliefs, how that was similar or different to what he knows of grays. So once I sent him the Reddit post and he started reading it, it was literally a couple minutes into the post. He had barely read anything and he messaged me back like, okay, these are definitely not grays. I'm just telling you right off the bat, I'm going to read it. These are not grays. And I was like, oh, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. I totally thought they were. And so um, if you guys haven't seen, I did just post a video on TikTok and on Instagram. And basically some of the reasons that he says is because um, these seem like Ebens. Oh, thanks so much, Natasha. Um, so... He said that these are what appear to be Ebens. And as you guys know, um, we've talked about Ebens before. They're not my favorite to talk about. Um, part of the reason that I don't talk about the Ebens too much is to me, it's a little interesting that all of the information about Ebens seem to be coming from the U.S. government. I haven't seen anything else about Ebens. Now, that doesn't mean that no one else is talking about Ebens because maybe the word Eben is just the name given by the government and that these things are happening all over the world, but that they're not calling them that, that maybe they're calling them grays or they're calling them something totally different. So now you guys know, um, early on in my TikTok, 
uh, journey, we did a video about we did a video about the E.T. thing, you know, like that, how basically the movie E.T. is based off of real events. It's based off of this thing called E.B. E.B.E extraterrestrial biological entity. And these were the aliens that were allegedly retrieved from Roswell. So we've heard about that in Behold a Pale Horse by uh, William Cooper. He published that information in like 2004. (laughs) An Eben is jumping out of the book right now. An actual Eben. (laughs) Um, So they say. And according to this, I'll just refresh you guys since we're talking about Eben's while we're here. And we are going to get into the Stephen Greer movie after this, because I have so many notes. I got to go to the premiere. I got to meet him. I got to do, I got to do a little interview with Stephen Greer. Um, and I have like a weirdo. Um, I brought my notebook and took, I took notes in the, um, movie theater. So I have like six pages of notes that I took in the dark. So it might be a little hard for me to read because I couldn't see the lines of the paper, but I was just trusting there was lines where I was writing. Um, Okay. So the Ebens, the Ebens. So the live alien, now this information is coming from Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper. And sorry, guys, you know, I have TikTok live over here. That's why I keep showing it that way. Um, The live alien that was found wandering around in the desert from the 1949 Roswell crash. Now, this is the thing is there was not only one crash. That's another thing that we got to, you know, 1947. 1947 was one of the crashes. Allegedly in 1949, there was another crash and that there was a live alien that was found wandering in the desert. His name, he was named EBE. The name had been suggested by Dr. Vannevar Bush and was short for extraterrestrial biological entity. EBE had a tendency to lie. For over a year, he would give only the desired answer to questions whenever he was asked. Those questions, which would have resulted in an undesirable answer, he left unanswered. At some point during at some point during the second year of captivity sorry let me use this EB to keep my eyes in the right spot let's see at some point during the second year of captivity he began to open up the information derived from EBE was startling to say the least this compilation of his revelations became the foundation of what was later called the yellow book photographs were taken of EBE among others i was to view these photos later in project grudge In late 1951, EBE became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of EBE's illness. They had no background from which to draw. EBE's system was chlorophyll-based, and he processed food into energy the same as... He processed food into energy the same way that plants do. Waste material was excreted the same as plants. Several experts were called in to study the, bio- the the illness. These specialists included medical doctors, botanists, and entomologists. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try to help him recover. Dr. Mendoza worked to save EB until June 2nd of 1952, when EBE died. Dr. Mendoza became the expert on at least this type of bio- of this alien biology, and the movie E.T. is a thinly disguised story of EBE. In a futile attempt to save EBE and to gain favor with his technolog- technologically superior race, the United States began c- broadcasting a call for help in, the, in 1952 into the vast regions of space. The call went unanswered, but the project, dubbed Sigma, continued an effort continued as an effort of good faith. Okay. So there's obviously so much more information, but that's the background of kind of the first way that I heard about Ebens and kind of a lot of the information that's about Ebens is coming from these declassified documents. So it's pretty interesting, you know, after this biologist 
is saying that he worked with this biological entity. Now, when we asked Tim, Tim is like, okay, but the grays are not biological at all. Like they don't have any of that. They don't have nostrils. They don't have ear holes. They don't have uh, a mouth. They don't have any body openings. Um, He also says that, you know, in the Reddit post, the guy talks about how he peeled, you could peel the film back from the eyeball. What's interesting is now that has been talked about on many different places. So we see that in the alien autopsy video. If you guys have never watched it, it's super gross. I don't I don't know if I suggest it. If you want to, it's called like the Sant- Santilli, Santinilli, Santilli. I don't know. Um, Santilli. I'm just going to say it that way. Autopsy, alien autopsy. Just look that up. That's the video. Um, There's a lot of speculation about that. There is some leaked emails that claim that that autopsy is factual. A lot of people say that it's a replica of the original autopsy video, that it's not the official autopsy, that it's a replica of it. Now, in that video, if you watch, they do the same exact thing where they peel the black film from the eye. And I don't watch a lot of it because I couldn't even watch Uh, ER growing up like you know the show ER barely had anything gross in it I just don't I don't like that stuff I went to the bodies exhibit it was oh um no I could never I couldn't but um we see that they pull the film off the eye in that autopsy video and there is an eyeball underneath now what Tim said is that Ebens and Zeta reticulans or reticuli reticulize I've heard people say it, Zetas. I've heard people say everything. I like Zeta Reticulin. Zeta Reticulin sounds right to me. So those beings, oh, thanks for the gifts over there on TikTok, guys. Um, So the Ebens and the Zetas, according to Tim, have eyeballs behind the film. He says that grays don't have an eyeball, that it's a completely artificial system and that that system is transmitting back to a database, a vast database. So the same thing he said about their body, they don't have all of these biological things in their bodies that the people, the person who did the Reddit post talked about the being having ribs. He said, grays definitely do not have ribs. He said that basically now that was the interview. Then I went back and watched a bunch of these cosmic disclosure episodes. And in a lot of these episodes, what they're saying is the Ebens and the Greys have been in conflict with each other for thousands of years. That sometime thousands of years ago, their ideologies split, that they were originally from some type of common origin, that they have this common origin. Zetas also have the common origin and that there's many, many, many types of gray species, but that when we say the grays, we are talking about, you know, the ones that are doing the abductions. I did ask Tim, I didn't put this in the video, are Ebens doing the abductions at all? Are any of these abductions, are any of the abductions Eben abductions or are they all gray? Um, He did not say that there's definitely no Eben abductions, but he said as far as the infer the information that they have, it doesn't seem that the um, Ebens do abduct people. Hold on. My sound is like, I know, guys, I know. My sound is always awful. Literally, someone left a comment the other day that they're um, a sound engineer and that it's really annoying. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad that it annoys you. You think it doesn't annoy me every fucking Tuesday of my life? You think it doesn't? You think? Okay, let's see if that helps at all. It might be slightly lower than what I was, but I don't think I'm going to clip out as much. Okay, so final consensus is that those things that he was talking about are most likely Ebens, possibly Zetas, but that they are not the traditional gray. And oh, what I was saying is about the Ebens abducting. So he said that there's not really information that the Ebens abduct humans. He said that there is information that Ebens observe humans in their homes. 
So this is something that's very interesting is now I've heard many, 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 many UFO experience, contact the experiences, abduction experiences, especially too. you know, after going to contact in the desert and stuff, I went to so many different things where people shared that information. So, oh, thanks guys. Um, the sound is good for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the, um, one of the women that I heard her story at contact in the desert, she talked about, and I just thought it was such an interesting experience. And I, I absolutely believed what she was saying because she wasn't seen, seemed to be fabricating a story. And if she was going to fabricate it, she probably would have added like maybe more interesting details. And she said this happened, I think in the late eighties or early nineties that she woke up in her house and there was a gray alien looking at her fish in the fish tank and was observing the fish. And she woke up and that it appeared to startle it and that it ran and then went through the wall. And she said, the thing that was funny is that instead of just running that way, it ran around the long way. And she was just like, that was weird. Like, you know, these things are supposed to be smart. Why did it run the long way? Now that's interesting. When he told me that Ebens are not necessarily abducting that we know of, but that they are observing people in their homes. It makes me think about some of these scenarios that we hear about where people talk about grays, but it's not your typical abduction, all of those things like again and again and again, when we hear abduction scenarios and contact scenarios with grays, there is so many common details in so many of these different scenarios. So when sometimes those scenarios don't line up, it makes me think like I still believe the person because a lot of them have no motive to lie. These people are just saying it socially, not to get attention online or to make money. They don't have an, a motive to be making up this story. And I am inclined to believe people in these scenarios. Oh, thanks for the gifts, guys over there. And so now after that, I feel like, wow, if some of these non-traditional abduction scenarios or non-traditional contact scenarios might just be something like a different type of species, like an Eben, and that people are just calling them gray because they look so similar. And I mean, it's basically all the same characteristics. Okay, so before we switch gears to the Stephen Greer stuff, um, because that was really awesome. I was really impressed with the Lost Century documentary. It's much different than I was expecting because, you know, a lot of his other stuff is about ETs. This was about um, the free... Tech, the free energy and the zero point technology. And that was really interesting because that's the important stuff. And that also gives a little bit more clarity into why disclosure is so important and why they're hiding disclosure that it's not only, it's not really about the ETs. It's about the technology because the technology would basically eliminate so much of what we rely on for energy on this planet. And basically all these few people that are benefiting from fossil fuels and all of these other things that basically their interests and stuff are above the interests of humanity. So we're gonna get into that. But one of the things I wanna talk about before we wrap up talking about the updates of this Reddit post so then I also went and watched a bunch of the Gaia TV cosmic disclosure episodes from the beginning, from seasons one and two, when Emery was not the host yet, but Emery was the guest. And those first two seasons are hosted by David Wilcock. You know, there was a whole drama with them um, and he ended up leaving Gaia. This was so long ago, though. And then the show continued on with Emery as the host. So in those early episodes, Emery talks a lot about his own experience and his experience reminded me so much of what this Reddit poster had said. So this person on Reddit never specified if they worked in the military. Mm, I feel like there had to be something military. I just don't know if they would allow a regular scientist with an NDA to work on that stuff. I don't know. Maybe that stuff is so old and outdated, like, you know, working on an Eben in the year 2000 when they had the Ebens in 1951. So like maybe, maybe it's just like kind of, okay, like it's so down the line that it's old and that it could be worked on by just a scientist. Or maybe that person does have military background and never gave that because that would have let 
um, some people know who they are in the post. Anyway, Emery is someone who worked with like exobiology. He talked about doing the alien autopsies a long time ago. A lot of the stuff that's in that post, he has talked about separately, which does also make me feel like, oh, maybe someone that wrote that post could have watched the alien autopsy video and could have just watched a ton of episodes of Cosmic Disclosure. But I still think that that person was very logical and spoke in like a scientist. You know, that was my opinion. And also the way that he answered questions so quickly about technical stuff. I feel like if he was just making that up, I don't think he would have been able to get those answers so quickly. But besides the fact, some of the things that Emery brought up were very interesting. So one of the things that I asked Tim, but Tim had no knowledge on, and then I ended up watching all of these episodes of Cosmic Disclosure and finding Emery talk about it. Emery said that there's an inner skeleton of metal inside of some of these beings. And this is exactly what the person on Reddit said. They said that there was copper oxide crystals instead of bone marrow inside of their bones. What's so interesting is Emery says that they had an inner skeleton made of metals. Interesting. Emery also talked about the film on the eye. And he said basically that every single extraterrestrial specimen that he ever worked on had this film. They all have it on their eyes, to his knowledge, and that they all have a film on their head, at least, and that a lot of them have the film on the body, too. And he said the only times that he's ever come across anything that didn't have this film is because another technician had already removed it and that there was record that it used to be there. So I thought that was interesting. Some of the other things that was interesting that Emery talked about, there was actually a lot that I couldn't fit into the video. The video is like, you know, already like eight minutes on TikTok, which, you know, is like really pushing the limit on an app that has 15 seconds of attention span, you know, but so I got as much as I could fit into it. One of the things that I wasn't able to fit into that video is Emery was asked by David Wilcock in those interviews on these old episodes of Cosmic Disclosure. He was asked kind of like, what is the motive of this? What are they doing this for? Why are they, um, collecting these specimens and doing these things. So he said, okay, one of the things is there's a da database, like an encyclopedia that they're trying to build of frequencies. That it's, he didn't say it's not about the biological stuff, but he said the frequency is the crucial part. So, oh, oh, hi, Ian. We have an Earth Files report about the gray colored skin thin body suits encountered in the Wright Patterson Air Force Base and we'll cover them tomorrow on Earth Files on YouTube. Oh my God, you guys, um, we'll stream that on TikTok. Um, we did last week too. Last week we streamed the Linda Moulton Howe interviewing Whitley Strieber on Earth Files. Um, we watched it live and then on, and then I was streaming it to my TikTok. So um, we should do that tomorrow too. Um, if I actually, I might have to be somewhere tomorrow, but if not, then I'll do that. And then if I am busy, we'll do it later in the day. We'll watch the replay um, because that's really cool. I'm really excited about these body suits, these gray skin that are like body suits, this like film. Same thing like the guy said in the Reddit post that there's this transparent film and multiple people said, even Tim said also in the interview that I did with him that there was the film on the gray's body as well. Now he said it's transparent. Um, and I don't know if that means that the skin underneath is gray or it's not skin, it's totally just fiber printed. Anyway, so some of the things that Emery said that I thought was really important was why are they doing this? And he said, they're creating a database of frequencies. They want the frequency of all the different spe species. They want the frequency of all the different craft and they want the frequency of all the different DNA types. And that it's basically a database that they're creating. And now what I've heard from other episodes and other insiders is that there is something to do with these frequencies that they're able to tell and I've heard this from many different insiders, they say the same thing, that basically there's some way of determining people's frequency. Every person has an individual frequency as well and an, an energetic signature. Emery has said in some of those episodes that the government already has everyone's energetic signature, 
like in a database somewhere. He said, if you've ever gone through a red light camera or if you've ever gone, you know, traveled, gone through the airport, gone through these things. He said these like official things that you kind of go through that document stuff. He says they all collect your like frequency, your energy signature. And basically it goes into some database somewhere that is like a covert thing. So that's pretty interesting, too, because then I've heard other insiders talk about that they can tell by people's frequency what type of hybrid they are. That basically, sorry, there was a weird noise um, that there is like they could tell, like, basically, if someone is like a Pleiadian starseed in a way, because there's a frequency that aligns. Now we're seeing with what Emery says that there's some type of database of all of these different frequencies. He said some of the other things that are being done with this through the military industrial complex, that some of these private corporations, what they are intending to do with these specimens, he said hybridization, um, genetic manipulation. And the craziest one is and that might not be all of them, but the craziest one was that they're also creating fake aliens and that they're growing fake aliens in facilities and that these aliens can look whatever way they need to look for a backup plan. That basically, you know, like an alien scenario that they, he said that they can have aliens that are scary looking, that are evil looking, that are beautiful, that are attractive, basically whatever is going to suit them. And they can create all of these different things. And this is why they are harvesting these specimen and what they want to use these specimen for and to basically create different species in these labs. That's according to Emory Smith. So, you know, since that's all on the topic of the Reddit poster and some of it did link up. Oh, and one of the things too that I want to clarify that I did put in the video, and I'm just going to reiterate. Emory said that, you know, for example, he worked at Kirtland Air Force Base um, and he was doing uh, active duty But he was also serving like military stuff, but then also having a civilian job. The civilian job was still on the Air Force Base by a private company. So he says, you'll go on like Air Force Base. And then he says, like, say, for example, the Kirtland Air Force Base has the Sandia labs on that base. Those labs, he says, there's sub levels that go down into, you know, the underground and that different levels and different parts of those sub levels terranean aspects of this lab are licensed out to different contractors. So different private contractors have contracts for these different parts of these labs of the military industrial complex. And then he says that, you know, so then the air force is the security for that la- that base, that it's not the Air Force that's doing this. And sometimes these things are on army bases. It's not the army doing this. The army and the Air Force are simply the security for the military industrial complex because the things that they're working on are weapons and top secret. And if any of those things were to get out, it would be a matter of national security. So that's how these things are operating in these ways. And that's how like people don't people don't know what's going on on these bases because they understand that these are top secret weapons and top secret military stuff that even if they knew would be a matter of national security. So I thought that was interesting to make note of. Yeah, that's true, Elizabeth, that they could um, make like a new aura camera and tell people what species they are. They would make such a killing with that, but we all know that they would much rather use it for nefarious purposes. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the lost century. So this past, a couple days ago, I don't remember what day it was. Was it Saturday? Oh, yeah, it was Saturday. Um, I got last minute invited to go to Stephen Greer event in Los Angeles. So he was doing a um, his Los Angeles premiere for his documentary, The Lost Century. It was really cool. It was in downtown Um really, I mean, huge turnout. I was really surprised how many people were there. And then also I was lucky enough to go to the after party. And at the after party, I was able to get a quick interview with Greer. It was only about five minutes and I only got to ask him about two or three questions. Um, So I am going to be posting that on TikTok probably tomorrow. Um, However, the, you know, I, I think I asked him about basically like, what does he feel about this mainstream whistleblower narrative? And I have to kind of like, look, he did say like, 
David Grush is working for the cabal. I was like, ooh, oh, wow. <laughs> Um, also in other news, you know, every time I do these Tuesday night lives, I have to update you guys on the newest thing that TikTok has done to suppress me. So then just yesterday, now I don't think I was the only one that got taken with this, but, uh, TikTok decided to like change the copyright stuff on some of the songs that they make available for you to use. You know, I didn't like download this and put it on there. I selected it from TikTok's own audio database. And now my David Grush video, and I know I said this many times that I was like, wow, I could talk about David Grush and I haven't had any issues. I talk about the Stephen Greer stuff. Oh, and I get banned two times. Well, I take it back because now my Grush video, which had like over 300,000 views, um, has been completely muted. So if you click on it, there's no sound. You can't hear anything like there's captions still, but that's, you know, pretty much useless. So I reposted it and, you know. That was upsetting. Also, my never ending story video about the sixth dimension got taken down. Oh, my God. Thanks, Amber, for that cute gift. That was adorable. Um, sorry, there was a weird question over on TikTok. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about the lost century. So it was actually a, a great documentary. And here is some of the notes that I took. Let's see. OK, so one of the things that was really interesting that this was not in the documentary, but Stephen Greer said this before um, he gave a little speech before the movie started. And he said that basically the Senate has nine months to figure this out, because in nine months, there's something that's going down, something that's going to happen in nine months. So basically, the Senate is on a time clock. Now, this is not the first time we've heard this. We've heard multiple insiders, multiple people saying that there is like some type of countdown on disclosure, that there's some reason why there's a countdown. Um, he didn't elaborate what that was. Um, he did also say that, you know, he uh, feels that this whistleblower who we know as David Grush um basically is getting used by this narrative that there's a narrative, which is very interesting because the very companies that Greer is warning us about, I won't say them because I'm here on live on TikTok, but these very, you know, there's only four of them. These four companies that are the military industrial complex, that they are the exact people who with this mainstream narrative are going to get the funding. So basically they could disclose aliens and then need exponential funding. And now trillions of dollars get fed back into the very companies that are already using the reverse engineered technology. The very companies that we're being warned about are the same companies that are going to benefit from disclosure coming from the government. So it's such a complicated thing because all of us alien lovers, we want this like we want to we want the acknowledgement from the official channels, from the official, you know, from the government, from the Pentagon. We want them to admit what they've done. We want them to admit that they've lied. However, you know, it's such a difficult situation because then at the same time, all that means is that the Congress is going to pass bills for even bigger budgets for the DOD. And then the DOD is going to give all of that money back into those same four companies. And this is how the iron triangle works. So that part is a little bit sad. Oh, Haley, you went to the Elizabeth April um, GFL summit. Oh, that's cool. I love I've gone to a couple of them before. Um, I haven't gone in a while, though. Uh, but that I really like her, um, galactic federation channelings. Okay. So let's see the video, the movie kind of starts off talking about the climate change stuff and basically how so much of the climate change issue is coming back down to these fossil fuels and these energy sources and so much like even the alternative energy stuff and like as far as like say a tesla or something like that solar powered um electric vehicles those are not like also great and as you guys know i'm sure you guys have looked into this before but like you know the tesla is not really zero emissions 
because maybe the emission is not happening from the engine at that moment. But in order to get the materials to create those lithium batteries, they have to basically destroy the planet. So the means to get the material is super, super, super aggressive on the planet. It requires horrible types of mining. The mining is killing all types of stuff. So even with our alternative energy sources that we have, solar powered, that takes crazy amount of um, mining to get those materials. They don't last forever. And then they end up back in the trash because the solar panels oftentimes have to be replaced. People who've been on solar panel for a long time um, are finding out that they are not a lifelong investment that you're going to need to replace them at some time, at least from what I've heard from people personally with their own experience. Um, so that's another thing too, is that then that ends up back in a landfill. Oh, thanks for the gifts over there, guys, Amber and Smile. Okay, so however... He And this is what's such a great point that he makes in the movie is that UFOs and UAPs, the reason that they're classified is not because of the extraterrestrial stuff. It's because they're operating on free energy. And basically, in order for these UFOs to exist, confirms that we don't need, oh, thanks, Smile, that we don't need to rely on fossil fuels and all of these other means of energy. So that part of this classification is not only about keeping us under control as far as our existence and our place in the universe, but also for the exact profits of, you know, the oil companies and, you know, what the Saudi families that own half those <laughs> half of the oil. And also, I mean, Russia, who also owns a lot of the oil that we, I believe, are still buying from them. Like, you know, so. OK, so the reason that the movie is called The Lost Century is because Nikola Tesla had already discovered free energy over 100 years ago. And that basically the last 100 years on this planet has caused such a deterioration since the Industrial Revolution in the early 1900s has de just completely destroyed the planet with all of this coal, fuel, like all of these things has caused so much destruction and has brought us to the point of an existential crisis where basically we're like, okay, the water's rising. We're going to die. This planet is going to, I mean, like the old George Carlin joke was the best where he says like all the hippies are saying, save the planet. He's like, the planet's going to be fine. We're going to get knocked off of it like fleas on a dog. And I'm like, that's the truth right there is that the planet will be fine. The planet will be fine without us, especially. And we will extinct ourselves and the planet will probably continue on. I mean, unless we blew it up. But we know that the from the alien stuff, we know that that's not going to happen. We know that the aliens are not going to let us blow up our own planet. But everything else they're going to let us do. <laughs> so, OK, he also shows in this documentary, this 1986 letter from Ben Rich, who works for Lockheed Martin, talking about the UFOs and basically com confirms all of this, confirms that the technology that we've been using for the last 100 years, even though there's been so many advancements, is obsolete because Nikola Tesla because Nikola Tesla had already discovered free energy and had it, you know, destroyed. Okay, so these UAPs, these UFOs, they're running on no fuel, no jets, no rockets. This is what they're holding back. That it's all... So, okay, so the cost of energy too. So... Now, in this documentary, they talk about how bringing the cost of energy down to nothing is going to solve every other problem. It's going to solve poverty. It's going to solve famine. It's going to solve the environmental crisis. He says a lot of these technologies that we would need would take too much energy. Like, say, for example, there's this talk about des desalinizing the ocean, basically removing the salt from the ocean water not like 
the ocean itself, but taking water and removing the salt so that we would never run out of water. Because we live on a planet of what? 80% water or something like that. Or maybe that's us. I don't know. There's a lot of of water on this planet and only a very small portion of it is drinkable. And then what's even worse is that people, corporations feel entitled to that water and literally sell us that water. And then on top of it, charge us for the bottle. They charge you 10 cents for the damn bottle that they're giving it to you. What they're still in the water, selling it to us and then making us pay for the packaging. I mean, it's nuts. So uh, we have such a little bit of water, but also to get the salt out of the water would be too expensive. It would be more expensive than just draining the whole planet of all the water and all of us die. So, and you know, when something's expensive, the poor people aren't allowed to have it. So also agriculture, a big part of agriculture is okay, yes, you grow the food. However, transporting the food, bringing the food from point A to point B takes a ridiculous amount of fuel. So much like, I forget, I I was talking to someone and they said basically like, did you know that peanuts are grown in California, but then all the peanuts are transported to Texas and then they make all the peanut butter in Texas and then ship that out to the places. So the amount of fuel that is used for each individual item of food is astronomical. So him saying that basically this whole documentary's purpose is to talk about how this free energy would basically solve all of these problems. Because if the energy is free, the cost of food goes down. The cost of agriculture goes down. The water accessibility goes up. The also there's other types of technology. Now I saw this movie with my friend Chelsea When she was in Israel, she said they actually have that technology in Israel because that was the only place I've ever seen it where she said that. So in the movie, they talk about how basically also there's ways to get clean water out of the air. It could basically take all of the moisture from the air or some of the moisture from the air because it's endless and then purify it and then have clean drinking water, which would make clean drinking water available to everyone everywhere, even if they're nowhere near a water source. So Chelsea said she did see this um, technology in Israel years ago when she had traveled there. Um, But again, that technology uses a crazy amount of electricity that it's not effective. If it costs that much to make a cup of water, it's not really sustainable then. So all of these things would, the cost would basically go down to nothing with free energy. Um, Instead, we spend hundreds of trillions of dollars on energy. Okay, so one of the things also too, so there there was this guy in the movie called, uh, his name was Charles Einstein. And he talked about when you ask people, how bad is the energy crisis? He says, it's hard to answer because are we talking about the crisis to humanity? Because if we're talking about the crisis in general, There's a lot of threats before humanity gets the threat. And he said one of the biggest things is the complete extinction of insects, that insects are dying at a rapid rate and that they are the foundation of this planet and that we're not realizing that there is a mass extinction going on. And um, I think also in the film that they said something like 150 species go extinct every day, not all animal species. Of course, that could be plants, you know, bacteria, maybe not bacteria. I don't know. Do they ever go extinct bacteria? I have no idea. Um, but that all of these other um, that these these things are going extinct every day at such a rapid rate and that we don't even know. Also, um, that none of these companies are being held accountable for this. So companies like Exxon are basically able to do whatever they want. And then even worse, those CEOs get hired into the government. Like the CEO of Exxon later became the secretary of state of the United States. This is another thing. How are any of these companies going to be held accountable if it's a revolving door for them to be hired back into the government to make policies that literally enable the companies that they used to work for to commit crime against humanity? 
So um, with all of these things, um, oh, wow. Okay, yes. So in, what year was this? Was this in 1977? Oh, in 1977. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. 1958, Life Magazine. It's crazy in a dark theater how much notes I got. Okay, 1958, Life Magazine did a ad for Exxon Oil. And it was for the company that it was called before Exxon, um, which I didn't write down the name, but it used to be called something before Exxon at that time. And this ad was them bragging that seven tons of glacier are melting a day because of Exxon. And they were like saying it as if it was a good thing. I don't know where that was spun. So then in 1977, one of the main scientists that was working for Exxon, his name is James F. Black. He warned in 1977 and said that for the last 15 years of that time, Um, that base, oh no, he said there was only 15 years left before this is a complete crisis. Um, that is not, we're not going to be able to come back from. And he said that the very science that him and others scientists that worked for Exxon were warning about was lied about from Exxon, that Exxon has released all of this information that contradicts all of their findings and that he came forward and tried to basically like whistleblow on the situation. Obviously nothing happened. Exxon only became more powerful. Um, we have an entire system that is set up to benefit a couple of oligarchs. And that's so true. This is literally what we're living in right now. A couple of oligarchs are benefiting while billions of people are suffering more and more and more. And then the only solution that these oligarchs are willing to offer is a future by escaping into virtual worlds like meta, like these things, like basically what they want to start creating is you know, Neuralink and Meta and the Metaverse, all this stuff that basically their solution to this world crumbling around us is to have us escape into virtual worlds in the future. Um, And that people are wanting to go into those virtual worlds because the world is so sad around them. Also, the film says that, oh, thank you, Will, for the super chat. That's very generous of you. Um, It says that 30 million will be pushed into poverty to survive. Yeah, that 30 million people will be pushed into poverty in the coming years because of this energy crisis, because it's going to bring up the cost of food. It's going to make energy too expensive to be accessible to people around the world. He said that there's 3 billion people in the world that don't have access to energy. They can't even cook their food. But using the free energy, they would have an endless supply and they wouldn't rely on any outside forces to bring them food, to bring them supplies, to all of these things because they'd be able to use their things. He says also this horrible system that we have right now on this planet, it forces people, indigenous peoples, um, people throughout, you know, third world countries, that it basically forces people to convert their natural world into commodities, that these people should be allowed to enjoy their natural world around them, but that they can't even enjoy their natural world because it needs to be converted into commodities and that they themselves have to be converted into commodities and that basically their labor is the only thing that they can do, either stripping their own land to survive or putting themselves in horrible labor conditions to survive. And this is what's happening all around the world. None of this is, you know, news to anyone. But um, it was really interesting how much this this movie really portrayed this information that so much of this is coming back to if we just had the free energy that Nikola Tesla discovered like 120 years ago and that was destroyed, a lot of this would have never happened. 
because there wouldn't have been a need to. If everything, we didn't have to pay for all of the energy of everything, then there's people that would have never had to turn their natural land into a commodity just to survive. Um, and another interesting point from the movie was that we don't live in a universe of scarcity. We're living on a planet that is showing us scarcity, but the universe is not a scarce place. It's abundant. And we know that the universe is abundant. We know that the galaxies are abundant. We know that all of that. So this idea that we need to, that we're living in scarcity on a planet that has more resources than any other planet we've ever discovered, but we're the ones that are living in scarcity. I mean, there's a really good existential questions to ask. Um, and then they start getting into some really interesting stuff. And then they start getting into the suppression of free energy because th then like a lot of examples of people. And one of the most interesting things that I think that Greer brought up in this documentary was that, was that basically this free energy, it's suppressed. However, many people have discovered it. It's not like Nikola Tesla was the last great mind to discover it. And throughout it, you know, since he's been doing this since the 90s, he's known like at least like 20 people who have discovered free energy, including the guy with the, the, the car. You know, it's gone viral on like TikTok and everything. The guy who made a car that runs on water. It was basically altering a car that runs on water. And then he was whatever killed. Greer also, so he, there, that guy, there's another guy, like there's so, so many. Then in, the, in the film, he goes through like eight different people, but there's even more that he doesn't go through. But these like eight people, basically, he calls it the inventor syndrome. And I think that's really interesting because part of it is the suppression. One aspect is absolutely these people are being taken out when they discover free energy. However, one of the really important points that he makes is that part of the problem is the inventors because they get what he calls the inventor syndrome that basically the person goes and he uses the example of like, I think the guy's name is Gollum, Gollum from Lord of the Rings. I never saw Lord of the Rings, but where he's like, my precious, he says, that's what these people get. They get like, oh, this is my precious and they get so focused on patents and making money off of it and be, it being exclusive to them and the profit. And then he said, he told, tells each of these people, you're going to take this to the grave. If you don't put this open source, and this is what he says, he says, the only solution is open source. If this information, this zero point energy can just be released to all, to everyone, just like how... We got ChatGPT. ChatGPT was an AI open source that was given to everybody and then it was developed. So now he, he's saying that like, if you just open source the zero point energy, you can change it for everybody. Give everybody access to it. Let everybody use it in whatever way they want. And that's the only way that you could stop the suppression from these corporations, from the military industrial complex. And it's so true. And he gives like eight examples and it's really honestly, I mean, even though like a lot of the movie is the planet dying, the, surprisingly, the inventor syndrome part is even more sad because these people literally discovered the ability to change the planet, to save the world in a way. And they understandably are worried about the patent and then uh, understandably they want to make money off of it because we all need money to survive However, that very thing is the same thing that leads to them taking that information to the grave because they try to get the patent, which is the number one mistake that they make. They try to get that patent dead. You're going to die. You try to get that patent. Second of all, you're going to be the only one who has that information. So when they take you out, they take you out. So I thought that was really interesting. He also talked about these um, FBI documents from Nikola Tesla um, that were there's documents from 1943 that show that they confiscated stuff, documents from Tesla's 
place. Like these d- documents resurfaced in 1943. Someone was asking for them in some declassified documents. He said, also, there's 500, oh, there's over 5,000 inventions that have been seized by the government. So on top of it, even to the level of suppression of their own military industrial complex, that's how bad it is. Because also he says this example where Boeing, and we know Boeing is one of the four, is one of the four companies that we're talking about that is of the military industrial complex. They are the ones who are doing this. They are the ones who are contracting one of those levels in these labs. They are the very exact people that we're talking about when we're talking about the military industrial complex. And Boeing asked the U.S. government if they would be allowed to use some of the technology that they discovered in the secret programs on their commercial jets, because clearly they own the technology, but it's under contract with the DOD. So they have a contract where they're not able to then for national security reasons, even if they have like their um, military contracts and then their commercial stuff. Those are like kind of like separate worlds within the company. So they wanted to use some of the technology that they had discovered probably to save fuel in their or not use fuel at all. Maybe we don't know exactly what the de- what the invention was, but they actually asked the government for permission to use the own te- their own technology on a commercial craft. And they were denied. Even the company themselves were denied. So this really also goes to show the level of it. This is, is that also like, yeah, these military industrial complex are definitely like the bad guys, but they're not alone because it's this triangle. Okay. Another thing, the EPA is not about protection of the environment. The EPA is to protect these technologies. (laughs) Okay. Um, So there's a lot of stuff. There's the cold fusion stuff. So there was a whistleblower in 1989 who came forward and talked about the plasma fusion stuff. So basically in 1989, this cold fusion, I don't know much about this. I don't know about free energy. You know, I just know what I've researched a little bit, but I, I don't understand. You know, I'm not a physicist or any of these things. So His name is Eugene Malone, and he was an MIT scientist, and there was a discovery of something with cold fusion, um, plasma fusion. There was a cold fusion something at the plasma fusion center in MIT. He says that there was a discovery made on July 10th of 1989. He said on July 13th of 1989, he reviewed the document and that the document had been tampered, that it had been manipulated, that the exact information that was in the document three days earlier was now false calculations that would never work. So he was a whistleblower. He came forward on behalf of MIT um, suppressing this information. Uh, And I'm pretty sure he died too. I'm pretty sure they killed him too. Um, But I don't have that in my notes here. Oh, no, no, I do. He was murdered. It was. I just have murdered written down. Yes. Okay. Uh, 33 years later, which just brings us very recently, um, that now they're talking about that there's a fusion energy breakthrough. And however, this fusion energy breakthrough that they're talking about right now, according to the scientists in this movie, they're saying that this fusion breakthrough that they're talking about is not even a fraction of what was on those MIT documents. So even still, like they're basically trickling it out because they have to, but that they're trickling it out at still such a level that allows them to have complete control and to have all of these costs. Okay. This was interesting. Uh, I forget the context in which it was used, but plasma is the fourth state of matter. Maybe you guys know this, but maybe not everybody does. So for example, ice is the solid form of water. And then with heat, it becomes liquid water. With more heat, it becomes steam. And with more heat slash energy, each of these could be energy heat, I guess. With more, it becomes plasma. Okay. Uh, Oh, plasma is some type of inertia field. It can can hold a field of inertia 
and that the plasma is the reason why some of the UFOs glow. The fact that some UFOs are glowing, they're saying that's an effect from the plasma. Okay. Oh, yes, this is the guy, St Stan Meyer, who created the car on water, got invented, invention syndrome. Uh, Greer tried to buy his stuff after he died um, and open source it. But nope, they took it to the grave. Mm hmm. OK, G engines are coming. 1955, there was a bunch of articles called G Engines Are Coming from the Miami Herald. A bunch of different ones were shown. And these are called gravity engines. And so back as far as the 50s, there was all of these articles about how gravity engines are on their way. This makes perfect sense because they reverse engineered the Roswell craft and now they were able to understand the propulsion, inertia, all of these things to be able to make anti-gravitic technology. Now, in 1955, they said that it's on the way, it's coming, it's here. Clearly, that was not the case because it was suppressed again. Um, let's see. Okay, with this technology, and I think this is my, oh, yeah, this is the last of my notes. With this technology, with free technology, with zero-point technology, People speculate that within 20 years, there would be no poverty on the planet, that within 20 years, it could completely cure all of the poverty on this planet because most of poverty is coming back to those basic resources. And if those basic resources, the cost of them can come down so significantly because the energy is free, then it's fine to transport food from one place to another or to extract water from the air or to desalinize the water. Like it gives all of people the access to the resources with free technology because the biggest thing is the fuel is that is the energy that it takes to create these things, to bring these things here, you know, to desalinize the water takes a crazy amount of energy. The technology needed to heal Earth already existed. It's not a block in the technology. And also, okay, so this is this is the last part that I will share from the documentary. So I believe it was Charles Einstein was his name who said this um, in the film. He's an environmentalist. And I thought this was really interesting and beautiful that he said, if you were to you know, leave a parking lot unkept, unattended. It's just like, you know, you put down cement and then he says, in five years, it will be pretty taken over by weeds. Like, and you guys know this, um, the weeds will come through the concrete and all this stuff. And that's just a matter of life. And so he said, within five years, this thing would be totally, completely dominated by weeds. He said, in 15 years, there would be so much growth that you would hardly see that there was pavement between them, you know, between the plants. And then he said within 50 years, there would be no sign that a parking lot ever existed there. And that is a testament to the power of life on this planet and that this planet's, this planet's ability to survive and to strive towards life. So um, one of the things that they talk about is the compassionate transition. So basically transitioning from this world that we're in now to a zero energy world is going to take a lot of integration and compassion because you don't want all these people to just lose their jobs. So there would need to be a lot of programs to teach these people all of these new skills and new things and that it would need to have some work, but that they, you know, all these years that they've been working on this, you know, they have some solutions. Yeah. And then there's also this incident that comes up in the citizens hearing too, which I'm going to get more into that in something else. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the Stephen Greer film. Oh, and before we go guys, because then this is, what are they called? Anti-gravity engine. So in the 50s, it's called a G engine. So a G engine, look up like 1955 G engine Miami Herald. Um, you might be able to find the article. That's the notes that I have from that. Um, but I haven't looked it up myself. 
Um, Oh, so one of the most exciting things that I'm going to say before I go here on YouTube, and I actually might stay on TikTok a little bit longer. So if you guys want, we can follow me over there. I'll probably go live for like another like 20 minutes on um, TikTok. Okay. I had to ask Stephen Greer, because you guys know this is one of the controversial things that comes up about him is that he believes that there's no hostile alien races. And he said this at time and time again. And I think that's one of the most divisive things um, about this, that a lot of people just who really like his work have trouble understanding what he means by there's no hostile races. So races of aliens, meaning. And because as you know, we're big believers in, you know, different alien species and that some of those species might have nefarious or self-serving purposes. Now, I had to ask, I'm like, so do you think that there's no hostile species or do you think that they're just not a concern to us? Do they not exist or just not our problem? And I'm not going to say I'm pretty proud of myself for asking that question. Because, you know, sometimes I ask the softball questions when I'm in person. Um, I mean, in general, you know, I, I'm i not someone, you know, I'm not Barbara Walters. I'm not hardball. I'm not trying to, like, put these people on the spot because I love them and I love what they're doing and I respect their work. But at the same time, I do want to ask questions that are concerns for people because I do want to clear them up or at least get an answer on them. And his answer, which I will be posting in a video, and I'm sure, you know, I'll, I'll still say it here because... I'll end up posting it on TikTok tomorrow. But Greer said that basically if a planet is still hostile, if a species is still hostile, it wouldn't really be possible for them to reach the technological advancements that they need in order to come here. That like the same way why humans are so limited in interstellar travel is because we're dangerous because we're still ruthless and we kill things when we're scared. And when we don't understand something, we kill it, we harm it. We're killing our own planet. We're killing our own bodies. We're killing our own people. We are super toxic. I know everybody wants to talk about how the aliens are the fallen angels. I'm like, yo, we, we really seem a lot more like fallen angels than anything. So just saying. Um, oh, thanks, Mel, for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, so basically, yeah, Rudson, you're right. The Orion group are considered a negative, um, but they don't kill. Interesting. Yeah, that a lot of people are saying that like these hostile races might have like self-serving purposes, but that they don't really take life. Interesting. So Greer's answer was these species do exist but they're not capable of the advancements in technology. And I, I've heard this before too, as far as humans, is that they say that until humans collectively reach level four consciousness, we'll never be able to get the level four consciousness technology available to the masses. That in order for humans to reach the next level of technological advancements, we have to reach the next level of consciousness. And I've talked about this before in some videos where, you know, talking about the topic of like CERN. Um, CERN, I think, is a perfect example because they are combining science and spirituality. They're doing those freaking rituals. We all seen the rituals. Whatever. I'm not saying spirituality isn't only of the light. It's just of the non-physical. So they are using things in the non-physical for whatever reason. And they are the ones that are making the biggest technological advances into the public that we can see right now. They're the ones making these huge discoveries. And you see this integration of like the non-physical spiritual quantum stuff with your traditional science. So I actually, I, I do believe that it would be hard for any type of species to reach that level of technology if they weren't at at least a higher level of consciousness. Now, at the same time, I can't say uh, I 100% believe in that. I do believe in reptilians. I don't believe all reptilians are bad, um, but I do believe that there's nefarious 
species that have nefarious intentions and that they do interact with humans and that they do interact with Earth. That is my opinion. But um, I'm glad that I asked Greer that question because also his answer is not completely, you know, like a lot of times people are like, oh, forget him. He says there's no hostile races. Well, then what about this, this and this? So I'm glad that at least um, we got an answer on why he feels that way. And that's what matters with all of these things. Again, guys, you know, we talk about this all the time. You don't need to agree with someone 100 percent. You don't need to agree with anyone 100 percent or me even 100 percent. You always use your discernment with whatever works for you. And there's a lot of times, you know, people have different points of information. And just because one thing that they said doesn't resonate with you doesn't mean that you should discount everything that they say. Or just because a lot of what someone resonates says resonates doesn't mean that you need to take everything that they say completely 100% as the absolute truth. Because anyone could have um, an impression or a perception um, that could be skewed or influenced or maybe just even as a human level, we're not at the level to see the full perspective. So we're also only at all times only getting a portion of the truth with everything because we can only understand a portion of the truth. Even in like these Pleiadian channeled messages, they say that like, at least in the Barbara Marciniak ones, which is also why I tend to lean towards those older channelings, because these, a lot of these younger, newer, these, these cool kids, hot kids on the block channelers, the new people, um, not that I don't believe that they're telling true information, it's just that there's, to me, a big difference between a lot of the newer channelers are talking like, this is the fact. This is the truth. I got the full information from an alien, from a god, from an angel, from this, from that. I got the truth. Whereas in the channelings, like say the Barbara Marciniak stuff, the actual Pleiadians themselves are telling us in that book that some of the stuff that they're telling us is only a story to help us understand. It is not really what it is, but it's the best that they can do for our level of understanding. Now, that's something always to keep in mind, because sometimes it is just our level of understanding, you know, and that's not the full truth. That's subjective truth, you know. All right, guys. Well, this was wonderful, um, as always. I really love doing these Tuesday night lives. A mind in gamma vibration can activate the anti-gravitic transdimensional vehicle. I do believe in that, Sergio, um, which I think this is also the reason why they need to reverse engineer the craft because otherwise, why don't they just drive the alien craft that they retrieve? And I think because, you know, a lot of times we've heard that the craft can't be driven by the wrong consciousness, that like you need to be the right person, the right consciousness in order to even operate the craft. Thanks, everybody. EA was just talking about getting info from the older GFL member and not a younger one. Very similar to your vibe. Oh, wow. Was she just saying that? That's cool. Now, see, one thing I like about Elizabeth April um, is that she almost every video says, take it or leave it. If it resonates, good. If it doesn't, that's OK. And I appreciate that she does that every time. And I know it's just like a disclaimer formality. But I, in her case, I genuinely feel that she means that, that she means like, I don't know if this is the 100 percent truth. You know, I'm being told that it is. But um you know, so I, I love Elizabeth April for that. Um, let me just scroll up in the comments and just see. Oh, thanks, everybody. Oh, right. This crazy stuff. Yes, Sergio. I've heard about this. I haven't gotten super deep into it. Um, that the Dr. John G. Trump, an electrical engineer with the National Defense Research Committee of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, has the Tesla documents. Yes, I've heard about some of this crazy stuff. Um, I haven't gotten into that. Let's see. Yep, a massive disclosure would need to happen to keep the military industrial complex at bay. That's true. An inventor needs to bring the energy to open source of Burning Man. Now there's a vortex that will lift it up to everyone. Oh, cool, yeah. That's pretty cool, like doing the open source, but also kind of integrating it with um, some type of grid work. That's a really cool idea. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, um, Mason, you said earlier uh, that Hawaii is a prime example of that, of what we were talking about earlier with um, being forced to turn their natural environment into a commodity. That's so true. Yeah. Is there really a solution when you created the problem in the first place? So true. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. Crimes against humanity. You're right. Yes, Elizabeth, the courage and vulnerability that it took for someone like Barbara to channel the Palladians when it wasn't trending. There is a purity to that that lands differently. I agree. Um, do you think that the specific craft operators have soul connections to these alien races? I, I don't understand the full question, but I do believe that there's some type, because a lot of things talk about how these craft appear to have consciousness themselves, that these craft are not like our cars, these craft are partly conscious as well and that they are to some degree, maybe not fully sentient, but there's something there. So maybe that's also, oh, hey, Ruben, I see you there in the comments. Um, and that maybe some of these, uh, some of these craft are connected in some type of soul contract with the consciousness that's in that craft. It could be. Um, I've just never heard too much about that. Oh, you get a lot of synchronicities with her information from her live videos from me or from Elizabeth April. Um, I get a lot of synchronicities from the Elizabeth April videos all the time. Oh, Ruben, loving your shows. Yes, we do love Ruben shows. Um, and speaking of earlier, we talked about the difference between like Ebens and Greys. If you go to, because now guys, I am a, a, a Gaia ambassador and this will be the last thing I say before I go. It's about time. I know I've only been promoting Gaia for free for almost two years, but now I am an ambassador. And one of the best things about that is that now I can create playlists on Gaia that you guys can watch. So I did just make a playlist for, um, based off of my newest video, which is about the, the interview with Tim about the Ebens versus the Greys. So if you go to the link in this, um, in this video here, um, if you go to the link, so whatever I have as the first video on the playlist, you guys will always be able to watch for free, even if you don't have a Gaia subscription. So right now, the first video is Tim talking about the differences between the Ebens and the Greys. Um, also on that playlist is the Elizabeth April interview, channeled interview with Ruben, where she's channeling another version of herself named Hira, who's a gray from zeta reticuli so that's really cool so that's on the playlist um i don't know if i can offer that one for free um i think i can only offer full gaia originals for free so i don't think i can actually put that one as one of the examples um maybe i can i'll try it but i think it has to be their own programming and as you guys know that's ruben's show that you can watch over on interviews with ed.org uh, yeah, so that playlist, um, also, if you guys don't have a Gaia subscription right now and after watching that, you want to get one, make sure you use my link. You'll get a seven day trial. And, um, I know most of, I know so many of you guys already got Gaia, dis Gaia subscriptions from when I've been talking about it already for the last two years, but, um, well, year and a half that I've been doing this. And so that's okay though. So even still, if you guys already did it, even though I was the one who referred you, don't worry, just go and check out the playlists. And those are a lot of the episodes. So I'm going to be switching out that playlist based on like whatever videos I'm posting. So like now that I have a video about the grays and the Ebens, the whole playlist is about Ebens, grays, and zeta reticulans. Um, and then when I post another video, I'm going to end up switching that out. Oh, and there's also a bunch of stuff on there about Emery's 
early episodes of Cosmic Disclosure where he's talking about being like exobiologist type of stuff that lines up with that Reddit post. So those are really cool. Watch those. And then um, if you're not a Gaia subscriber at this time, then just go and watch that first one for free. That's really interesting. Um, And then I'll be switching it out. Like maybe in like a day or two, I'll switch it out and do the Eben episode. And then in a couple of days, maybe I'll do the Gray episode. Um, But we'll see. If I end up posting a video about a different topic, I might end up clearing the whole playlist. So make sure you guys go Go there and watch it. Um, Yes, there's no code. So I don't have a code. It's just if you do it through my link. So if like you watch it like on my my the page with the playlist and then you become a subscriber through that or if you go through the link that I posted um, or like my regular website link. Okay, guys. Anyway, thanks. Oh, last thing before we go. Astrology and stuff says between 2024 and 2044, Pluto in Aquarius will probably bring tech to the public, but 2024, I mean, 2044 to 2066 with Pluto in Pisces will be when our spiritual consciousness is finally ready for integration. Mid 2050s turning point. Oh my God. Look at that astrology and stuff. We literally have been talking about all of these things from 2050. We have, oh my God, like guys, read the stuff, read, check out my video about the Sir Isaac Newton stuff, the apocalypse series, the earth shift series, um, all of these things, the remote viewing, the year 2060, the video that I did about, um, Mass Dreams of the Future, where all of these people rem- remote viewed the year 2100. All of these things, even the Elizabeth April channeling that I just did a video on, all say 2050 is the turning point. Oh, it's Chelsea. Hey, how are you? I miss you. Um, This is another Chelsea, guys. This is not my best friend, Chelsea. This is Ochel Yeah from TikTok who I freaking love her astrology videos. So awesome. Go follow her over there, guys. Okay, yes, guys, go follow astrology and stuff. That's Chelsea. Follow over here is Ian. We love you, Ian. Earth Files UK. Follow Ruben's channel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, What a great little Tuesday Night Live. I'm going to stay on TikTok for like an extra like 10, 15 minutes. And um, I know Natasha, I miss her. She literally makes like the best astrology videos. And please, Chels, make a book recommendation video because I get so many people asking me for astrology book recommendations. And I'm like, I don't have time to read about astrology. Um, But you are one of the people who I know who really knows all of those astrology books like the good ones not like the trendy ones like the legit stuff so I would love for you to make a video about that so that I could send it to people <laughs> okay guys I love you uh, again we've been these these lives have been going much longer and I know some of you guys are in a later time zone so I appreciate you staying up so much love thank you everybody and we'll see you next week bye everybody